Hello, everybody. Welcome to All Space Considered. Today is Friday, November 4th. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and uh, All Space Considered is brought to you by the Department of Recreation and Parks in the city of Los Angeles. We also like to thank our nonprofit partner, the Griffith Observatory Foundation, that helps us out with so much what we do. Um, tonight, on tonight's show, we've got a great show for you. Um, let me step forward just here. We've got Dr. Thane Curry. Uh, he's an astrophysicist professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and he's going to tell us about some cool uh, exoplanet stuff, and I can't wait to talk to him about that. Um, we, of course, have our beautiful astronomical pictures, pretty pictures with Katie and solar system weather. Um, this crazy solar image that we have as our background here um, maybe has something to do with it. I don't know. Um, the Sky Report with Patrick. We'll hear all about what there is to see and what's going on. Um, a little bit of info from Arecibo and um, how uh, important Arecibo really was that a lot of people didn't know some of the work it did. Um, but Sarah is going to uh, chime in with that and tell us more about that. And then we have a rock formation in space from our very own Haley Bricker. Um, it's going to tell us about um, how do these chunks of rocks get made out in space. We were talking about that from last month about if you're going to go nudge these things, did they get formed out there like that? Like the actual big boulder sized things? It's, I had questions. Um, so Haley's going to see if she can answer some of those for us. It's going to be great. Um, we'll have an out to launch segment. Jared is here once again to tell us all about what's going on. Um, I saw a few things out there. Uh, anyway, I saw some cool stuff and I don't want to spoil it. So you want to stay tuned for Out to Launch to, to, I'm sure, see some cool things. Um, Hipparchus Star Atlas, uh, Chris Butler, provided he sticks with us throughout the whole show, he's been threatening to cut off his internet and go rogue and go like off on the farm or something. So we'll hear from that. Um, and then I'm going to end the show talking about gamma ray bursts. There was a, a super, super energetic, the, the most energetic, brightest, so to speak. Um, gamma ray burst in our sky recently, and it had some interesting effects on Earth. And I wanted to tell you about what, what are gamma ray bursts and, and where do we think they come from. So that's our planned show tonight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and um, should, be, should be a good time. So uh, let's get right off to bat. Let's start off. Uh, Thane, um, I, I've been looking at social media where I get, I hate to admit, but I get a fair amount of my you know, hear you hear Lee, breaking news, astronomers, we, we can't keep a secret, as you know. Um, and let me introduce Dr. Thane Carey, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us on the show. You do come from University of Texas at San Antonio, but I know you from the Twitterverse. And um, there, there, there were some posts about exoplanet image, baby exoplanet, exoplanet forming in an unusual way. Um, this proves it, you know, all, all sorts of different levels of, cl of clickbait. And um, I had noticed you had chimed in at one point strongly in the side of the camp saying, look, this thing's probably real. Um, you know, enough folks are seeing it. It's been confirmed enough times. We need to be thinking of this rather than just a, a possible, you know, blob that maybe there's something really there. But first of all, um, I thought instead of me trying to go reproduce all of that, let's just invite you to the show. So here we are tonight, finally getting to talk about um, that object. And um, thank you so much for joining us to be able to uh, tell our audience about some real research that's going on about imaging exoplanets. So welcome to All Space Considered. Well, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be here. So I'm very excited to talk about um, the, the work that, um, that you just alluded to. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on work that we published recently in Nature Astronomy on trying to image planets around other stars, specifically image planets still in the process of forming around other stars. And what this tells us about uh, the diversity of planetary systems that the universe can, uh, can spawn and um, how the solar system is common or unique. And also just, just as a preface to this, uh, if you do have questions uh, during the course of what I'll present, uh, go ahead and chime in and interrupt, it's totally fine. It'll be a lot of fun that way, I think. So to kind of give you, this kind of step back a little bit. Um, in the past 30 years, we have identified now over 4,000, uh, I forget how many now, 4, 000, over 4,000 planets around uh, nearby stars. And these span a wide range of uh, properties. So 
over a factor of 100 difference in size and in the orbital period. Okay, now only a subset of these are planets that we can image, and they actually end up being really interesting in terms of understanding how um, our own solar system fits within this sort of broader context for, uh, uh, for planet formation. So here's an example of some of these directly imaged planets. These are all fully formed directly imaged planets. The one on the left, this is the first directly imaged planetary system. This is HR8799. You're showing, uh, so you're seeing a uh, movie of the planets orbiting all counterclockwise uh, in this image. And these have been studied for well since about 2007, 2008 or so. And then we've identified about another 24 or sort of directly imaged planets. Now, what's really interesting, I think, compare what these planetary systems look like to the planets in our own solar system. So if you plotted the size of the solar system compared to the, size, to, compared to the scale of these planets orbiting their host star, uh, it's very different. So this is one of the most solar system-like directly imaged planetary systems that we know about. And still, you know, it's, um, all, of its, all of its planets were about very wide separations. So the outermost planet is about 70 astronomical units, like maybe about twice the distance between uh, the sun and Pluto, typically. So these are extreme systems. And not only are they very far away, they are planets that are massive. So over five times the mass of Jupiter. So how do we form these planets. And so that's really going to be the focus of what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about. And to really understand that we need to sort of bridge the gap between the starting points and the end points for, uh, for planet formation. This is an example of the pillars of creation image uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope. You see these beautiful filaments. Uh, these are sort of the nurseries for stars. And if you look at some of these, uh, some of these stars up, up close with like maybe the uh, James Webb Space Telescope or the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see these features, these sort of silhouettes of disks of gas and dust surrounding them. You know, so these protoplanetary disks uh, provide the seed material for planet formation. We're, and so this is the material from which, um, for example, in our own system, from which Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and all the solar system planets form. So if we want to understand how will we go from the starting point to the end point for a fully formed planetary system, we need to look at uh, stars surrounded by protoplanetary disks that appear to be incorporating, appear to be actively incorporating their material into, um, into planets. Maybe this be identified by different structures in these disks that are telltale signs of planetary systems. And we have a lot of these examples now uh, from uh, the best telescopes on the ground in Hawaii and in Chile, and also sometimes uh, in space uh, with HST and, and hopefully soon JWST. And we see evidence for these wide range of structures where they be maybe uh, clear cavities, spiral arms, all these we think are good telltale signs that that, that, that protoplanetary disk is starting to incorporate some of this material into, uh, into a planet. And so then the challenge then is to actually image systems where we detect both the protoplanetary disk and the planet. So we're actually seeing this process of, of uh, planet growth uh, happen in action. So one of the uh, archetypical systems for this is a star called AB Origae. So this is in the Taurus Origa star forming region. This is maybe about um, oh, like a couple of million years old or so, depending on who you ask, about two to three million years old, it seems to be sort of the, the consensus opinion on how old the star forming region is. And this is a, an amazing system. So if you compare the orbit of Pluto to the disk that we resolve, even with very old Hubble Space Telescope data, we see that this disk, this protoplanetary disk is enormous, stretching out many, many times larger than the, uh, than the distance between the sun and, and, and Pluto. So hundreds and hundreds of astronomical units. This is enormous disk and also it is very massive, uh, we think. And if we look a little bit closer at Abiria, we do find um, evidence that it does seem to have these sort of um, features in it that may be evidence for, uh, for planet incorporation or planet growth. So, 
in the early 2000s, we, we first identify evidence for spiral arms in, um, uh, in the disc around Aviriga. You see a couple examples of spiral arms on the image uh, shown at the far left. If we look a little bit closer, so this would be a little bit more on, on um, a little bit more on solar system scale. So maybe uh, about five times to 20 times the distance between uh, the sun and, um, and Jupiter or Saturn. We see even more structure. We see this um, really weird feature, actually, that almost looks like a baby Godzilla. And, you know, so it seems like there's a lot going on in this disk that um, motivates us to look further. Now, the images on the far left and the um, middle left, those are in the near infrared. So they um, are at about maybe one to two microns. They probe very small dust. If we look at other wavelengths, we can see additional uh, telltale signs that this disk is probably incorporating some of this material into a uh, planet somewhere. This disk. Specifically, if we look at pebble sized dust that's probed by, uh, for example, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, we see these two features. Uh, if, we look in, uh, if we look in gas, we see additional. Uh, spiral arms, specifically in carbon monoxide. If we look in dust, we see this cleared cavity. Now, both of these we think are telltale signs of a planet that is clearing out the dust in, um, in this disk and is launching or is connected to these spiral density waves in, in the disk. Okay. Also, Abiriga is a film star. So while the paper, uh, upon which we uh, focused our result on was under review. Um, this movie, Don't Look Up, uh, as I'm sure many of you have watched, came out. And um, actually at about the two and fifth, two minute, 15 second mark or so, you can actually see an image of Averiga uh, in this movie uh, and actually see roughly, roughly the location of, um, of the protoplanet that I'll, I'll be describing in a few slides. So this is great. You know, this, we have this really interesting system. We want to look a little bit more carefully to be able to see whether or not there's any, whether or not there's evidence for a protoplanet, uh, a little bit more directly, not just simply looking at features of the disk. And so to be able to do that, we need to get extremely sharp images of this system and be able to separate out uh, light from the uh, from the star and light from the disk and from uh, the planet. So if we want to do this on a ground-based telescope, we needed a very advanced, what's called an adaptive optic system to be able to rapidly correct for blurring of starlight due to the atmosphere, even on the best sites. So we use the Subaru Chronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics Project, or SCEXIO for short. This is an AO system on the Subaru telescope on Mauna Kea. Um, it uses a very advanced sensor to be able to figure out exactly how the atmosphere is blurring starlight and then uses a small deformable mirror with 2000 actuators to be able to correct for that atmospheric blurring over 2000 times a second. It was able to get extremely sharp images and we quantify this in terms of a quantity called the Strel ratio, which basically means we get extremely sharp images, about 90% of the theoretical maximum sharpness we can possibly get. So then we feed the sharpened starlight to a suite of science instruments the two that are gonna be focusing on are an integral field spectrograph in the near infrared. So basically what this means is that you get a bunch of different images at all these different wavelengths uh, simultaneous, simultaneously. Then you also have an optical uh, instrument to be able to get uh, images of the system in uh, visible light. And we assist our, our program with, uh, with Subaru uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope you know, so that was launched many, many, many years ago but it's still quite powerful. And we're able to complement our Subaru observations, looking at a slightly different range of wavelengths and also looking at a, a data taken over a 20 year time span. So this is the image that we get. So the left, what we see is a composite image with Skexio. So our actual data is in blue. And the image from Alma, which is probing on the, the pebble sized dust, that's in red. So we're seeing composite image. So we see this bright blob here, as I denoted by a green arrow, almost due south of the star, lying interior to this ring 
of, of, of dust. Okay, and that in, in a, a sort of a protoplanet or, or source lying interior to a cleared ring, that's roughly what you expect for a massive planet uh, causing the clearing of this ring. And furthermore, if we try to actually model um, where we might think a planet would be to be able to explain those uh, CO gas spirals, there is one pr uh, predicted position for this that is dead on exactly where we see this protoplanet. Almost due south. The image on the right shows this um, system in a little bit more dramatic fashion, where we used a little bit more advanced processing and we scaled the uh, image intensity by uh, the distance it is from the star. And so you can see the AB Riga B, as we as we call this uh, protoplanet, is this bright blob that appears to be sitting on this very complex um, structure of the of the protoplanetary disk. We see all these different spiral patterns. Okay. And if you compare the size of, um, or so the distance that Averiga B is from the star, this is a very wide separation. So look at the little small inset region. That's the orbit uh, roughly of Neptune. Okay, so we're about five times, uh, four or five times away, further away from the star than Neptune is from the sun. So, sorry. So we also have uh, HST data, and this ends up being very important because, you know, if you have a planet very far from a star, it orbits very slowly. And sort of to really tell for, for sure that we're seeing an orbiting object as opposed to a static feature, we need to monitor this system for a very, very long time. Now, for this particular star, it means we would need to monitor the star for over a decade. Thankfully, we don't have to wait a decade in order to be able to confirm uh, this object. Uh, there were actually archival data for Averiga taken in 2007 that we, we reduced and we got a detection of this, uh, this protoplanet. We obtained new data with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in uh, winter of 2021. Now, if you look at the vertical line of, uh, in this image compared to the position of Averiga B, you see this appears to be uh, shifting in its position. So it appears to be consistent with what th roughly what we expect for counterclockwise um, uh, orbital motion. Okay, so this appears to be a moving object, which is kind of what we expect. Another key test we want to make is we want to be able to tell for sure that this source of light is different than the light we would expect from a pure protoplanetary disk feature that has nothing to do with the planet. Now, there are a couple of different tests we apply to be able to do this. So the first is that if we're seeing just uh, scatter light from a very, very, very small dust in, in a protoplanetary disk, that light will be visible in what's called total intensity, so normal scatter light or polarized intensity. So we're only looking at uh, polarized starlight. But if it's, a, if it's a planet, we would expect to see this emission in total intensity, but have only a weak signature or even a non-detection in polarized light. So if we compare the total intensity image of Averia B on the left to the polarized intensity image in the middle, we do see that B lights up in total intensity, but is, um, basically featureless as a non-detection in, um, in polarized intensity. So that's good. The other thing we would expect is that if this is a growing protoplanet, uh, it should be, or might be accreting. And we think we have good ideas of what the signature of that accretion should be. If it's like a star, it would be accretion that would show up very clearly at what's called the H alpha line uh, at visible wavelengths. So we obtained data with Skexio in the H-alpha line, and we see this detection uh, very, very uh, convincingly. So those are two very, uh, very key uh, lines of evidence. We also see that its emission appears to change as a function of wavelength as we go from about one microns to about two microns, which is the range of wavelengths we use to be able to uh, study uh, this, uh, this system with, with, with the Kara system on, on Skexio. It appears to actually be a lot harder to see. It gets a lot more confused with the protoplanetary disk at longer wavelengths 
but it really pops out at slightly shorter wavelengths at about one to 1.6 microns. In fact, if we compare its spectrum and its photometric points, so those are shown in magenta and those are shown in green, to models for what we expect for um, like a circumplanetary disk or an accreting object, and also model, models compared to what we expect for a sort of a scaled down star, scattered starlight, we see that it, is, it can be reproduced by about a 2000 or about 2500 Kelvin, it should be, that's a typo on the, on the, on the slide, about 2000 to 2500 Kelvin thermal source, and then a very hot uh, accreting uh, sort, source of emission. Now this composite itself appears to be inconsistent with what we expect for, for scattered starlight. So how massive is this, is this object? Well, we think if we, if we compare its luminosity to models for, uh, for, uh, for planets that try to map uh, planets as a function of, of luminosity, age, and mass, we think this is most consistent with the light we'd expect from about a nine to 12 Jupiter mass object. So this is really, really strange. This is about a nine to 12 Jupiter mass planet orbiting at a distance 20 times the distance from the sun to Jupiter. So how did that object form? And this is where I think where the broader significance of this result really gets to, uh, really kicks in. So here's Abiriga and the uh, detection of B. That is the solar system on the scale of this, of this image. So again, we're seeing this very massive wide separation object. How do we think that form? Well, if it formed like things like, the, like Jupiter and Saturn and its own solar system, it would have formed by core accretion. Or you start with um, very small dust that builds up to pebbles, then to boulders. And then once you have cores that become roughly about the mass of uh, several times the mass of the earth, they undergo runaway gas accretion. And they're able to suck up all the uh, gas surrounding them and they end up building up the, uh, um, core, the envelopes of gas um, in our uh, in Jupiter and Saturn and other gas giant planets. Now this works very well up to a few tens of AU separation. But Abiriga B is a, is at almost 100 AU separation. It's very hard to imagine how this particular mechanism would work to be able to explain what we see. Now there's an alternate mechanism which had been long sort of uh, challenged or, uh, or uh, almost discarded, I would say, called disk instability, where the, planet, the initial protoplanetary disk is so massive, it undergoes rapid collapse and, and pieces of it fragment um, at a time. Now this works conversely very well at wide separations at about 100 AU, so roughly where we expect, um, you know, so actually roughly where we see a, a protoplanet in the system. And in fact, and in fact if you um, um, do perform models of planet formation by disk instability, there's a, there's a range of initial conditions for planet mass that overlap roughly with what we, with what we think uh, Abiriga's protoplanetary disk might be that will end up forming at least one or maybe even a few more quantum mass fragments. So that's our result. We think that we found uh, evidence for uh, uh, Jovian planet formation at a wide separation, a very massive, maybe about nine to 12 Jupiter, ma Jupiter mass object, at about five times, it's about 20 times the distance between the sun and, and Jupiter that may have been formed in an entirely different way than any of the planets in our own solar system. And we'll see what we learn uh, later with future observations from the ground and from space. That's all I have. Well, that's, uh, thank you so much for that. That's super interesting to see the fragmentation like that happening. Uh, um, one of our uh, folks in our chat wanted to know how having such a massive planet so far from its star, how would that affect any uh, planets that might be closer in that we're not detecting yet? Um, how does having a massive planet out there, how does that affect their evolution? So that's a good question. And so at least um, 
I think it's probably easier to answer that question with the context of a planet formation or an own solar system where Jupiter's formation affected um, the asteroid belts and perhaps affected um, the orbital configuration of, of other, the innermost planets. Uh, I, there really hasn't been uh, a lot of, to my knowledge, a lot of detailed um, studies on how a very wide separation mass of planet formed by disk instability would have a practical consequence for planet formation at smaller separations. Uh, in a lot of these models, what we find is that these planets end up migrating. So a planet may be formed at 100 AU, may end up migrating inwards or outwards. So that might that may complicate the formation of uh, maybe rocky planets in the in the solar system. But there's really a lot to um, uh, you know, to work through with this type of system and to really be able to motivate yourself to, uh, to conduct that study, it's good to have examples of planets formed by disk instability. Uh, and this may be, this is a new result. And so we just maybe have not seen uh, the type of work um, necessary to be able to answer that question. Uh, okay. It'd be very interesting to see that. Yeah. The, um, do, do you think it's typical to have a protoplanet that's so far away from its star um, based upon what you've seen? That's another question coming from our, our audience. Uh, great question. So the easier way of answering that is we do have a good um, sense of the frequency of fully formed planets at these separations at so about 100 AU or so. That frequency is very low, maybe a few percent at most. Okay, so at least um, tens of millions of years after planet formation ends, uh, there doesn't seem to be very, very many um, massive planets at these types of separations. So this may be an extremely rare type of object. Okay, very interesting. Chris or Patrick, did you have any questions before I turn back to our audience one more time? Gosh, I sure do. Um, the uh, designation AB, if I'm remembering right, is a variable star designation, or does it have a companion? Um, it doesn't have a um, a stellar companion that that I'm aware of, and I, th that is in the literature. No, I was wondering if the presence of a companion might have uh, an impact on the material around a star and encourage or discourage uh, rapid collapse planetary formation. So I'm a little bit, a little bit unsure of exactly what would happen for a, like a binary star. Uh, what, what would happen with that with, um, uh, for forming a planet is sort of like intermediate distances uh, around gravitational stability. I imagine it would it would uh, complicate or suppress that method. But what we, what we do know, uh, or we do have some good confidence in, is that uh, medium separation binary systems. So you know where the uh, separation between the primary and the secondary is maybe the distance uh, between the Sun and Jupiter mm -hmm. to the Sun and Neptune. Uh, that does those types of systems seem to be well correlated with a reduced frequency of protoplanetary disks. So it either means that those type, those, that planet formation in those systems evolve, uh, operate very rapidly, or um, that the entire process is suppressed. And I suspect the latter is, is probably the more likely scenario. Right. Thank you. Yeah, pa Patrick, did you have, you're, you're muted as will happen. So is there any evidence of um, uh, planet breakup and forming kind of asteroid type uh, belts in these regions that, that, that have been seen? And, and, and could this shed light on how our own asteroid belt could have formed? Great question. So in this particular system, in AB Riga, um, the disk um, has some cavities or some gaps, but it but does it's still at the kind of an early stage to have a sort of like a classical asteroid belt or in a Kuiper belt, like this two belt system that that we're familiar with in our own solar system. We're at a little bit of an earlier evolutionary stage for that. There are other systems though, uh, including um, uh, including possibly H eight seven nine nine that fully formed planetary system, which have both an asteroid belt 
and a, a Kuiperville analog in the system. Um, there are a number a number of, uh, of of systems that do that do have that. Yes. Very very interesting. Um, so when you uh, when you see these sorts of objects forming, um, even if it is a super super rare one what do you think might be next? There's gotta be a reason you keep going back to image the next one. What are you hoping to find? Um, just curious, what's your what's your white whale out there, I guess, in terms of imaging an exoplanet? Okay, so I think there, there are two answers to that question. So one is, what is the goal, what's sort of the immediate goal for this particular focus with um, uh, studying planet formation? And then sort of the broader goal for uh, direct imaging in general. So the first, the first, I think what we're seeing um, with AB Riga and then with the other system with uh, directly imaged protoplanets, so that's PDS-70, we're seeing like this sort of like the, the low hanging fruit of planet formation, the easiest systems to, to be able to image. These are not typical systems though. So if we want to be able to study planet formation on a little bit more solar system scales, so like, planet formation on a true sun to Jupiter separation. We need more powerful adaptive optic systems and eventually larger telescopes on the ground uh, like ELT, TMT, and GMT. And then in space with a, 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 you know, a future flagship mission. So those may be able to give us, um, reveal this hidden population of, uh, of, growing, of growing planets. And so it may actually reveal systems that are a little bit more typical. You know, Abiriga is is a star two times more massive than the sun. You know, its disk is extremely massive. Uh, most stars are less massive than the sun. Their disks are less massive than Abiriga's disks. So as we get more powerful capabilities, we may be able to probe um, systems that are more representative of the typical system um, that forms. Broadly speaking, though, with direct imaging is that eventually we want to get to the point where we can image uh, an Earth twin around a nearby star, whether it be around a sun-like star or around a low-mass star. So the again, the types of systems that we are imaging right now that are still in the process of forming, these are a very mild contrast, meaning that the planet is fainter than the star significantly, but only 10,000 times fainter than the star or only 100 times that, 100,000 100, times bigger than the star. To be able to image an Earth around a low mass star uh, in the habitable zone, we would have to uh, be able to image uh, ones that are 100 million times fitter than, the, than their host stars. That's a lot more challenging. So that we require new technology to be able to uh, get us to that point. And then new technology in the process will help us study planet formation. Do you, do you think it's possible? Is yes. this reachable within how many how many decades off is it? Or are we waiting another ten years or twenty years or what? Do you, what do you um, I, I I am an I'm an optimist on this, um, mostly because I see this as an engineering problem, not fundamentally as a physics problem. Um, that if we had you know if we had the budget of the U.S. military, uh, this could be done um, with uh, fairly expediently. Um, you know, on, on you know, on astronomy times go right, but I think realistically, this will take um, you know, th this will take more than a decade from now, maybe two decades, to be able to get to that point where we're really starting to look at um, um, true Earth analogs around nearby stars. Yeah, we we want to see blue oceans and you know white ice caps, al along with maybe some brown and green continents. That would be certainly uh, a thrill. Um, I I was going to mention I, I came I came across a, a project um, in, and it's part of the NASA NIAC uh, proposal of sending a uh, a telescope uh, out to about 540 AUs and using the sun's gravity field as a lens to mm. image uh, planets. And I don't know if you've heard of that and that project. I I've, I've heard of it. I don't know the details for that. I mean, my, my focus is, has been largely on the capabilities um, that are upcoming on the ground and then the Roman Space Telescope at, as a springboard than to be able to, to image an Earth around a sun-like star with a flagship mission. Yeah. yeah. 
but that, that, that is, a, is an interesting idea. I, think. Uh, I, I don't know how feasible it is, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah, there's, um, there, there are more revolutionary telescopes coming for us to play with, which is very exciting. JWST is, it, it has really shown that it's, it's working as it was designed. It's working better than, than designed in some ways. Um, but we've got the Nancy Grace Roman coming. We've got, um, you know, the, the, there are exciting times about taking some, uh, being able to do surveys with large populations with wide mm -hmm. field of view. Um, you know, Andromeda and just a couple of pointings, I think it is, it's one or two pointings to do the, the bulk of Andromeda, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, anyway, um, some fun stuff to look forward to for sure. Yeah, um, it's an exciting time for sure. You know, and, and, even, and even beyond that, I mean, uh, the Subaru telescope is 20 years old, but it was still able to produce this result because we can keep upgrading and uh, enhancing uh, the telescopes we do have. So yeah. there's a, there's now, a lot there's a lot at our, at our disposal. For sure. Just because I know our, our fans like them, um, you were using adaptive optics. Were you shooting lasers out? Were you using laser adaptive, or was no? I was I, I wasn't using laser guide star adaptive optics. I was using natural guide star adaptive. Okay, optics. okay. So you were only where other bright stars were were located. Exactly. Uh, okay. Well, maybe we'll let you come back onto all space considered after you've used some lasers. I'll see what I can do about that. I, I, I kid, of course. This has been a, an amazing um, insight into hunting for exoplanets, hunting for direct imaging. This isn't just, um, okay, I'm, I believe spectroscopy. I believe the wobbles in the lines. But still, there is something super exciting to seeing an image and seeing a blob there and then have, seeing an image taking a handful of years later and that blob has moved in the manner you'd expect it to move when it's a planet. That's the stuff that you know, dreams were made of when I was a kid. So yeah. um, I find this stuff to be incredibly exciting and really do look forward to um, all the advances that are going to be going to be made in this. Seeing is believing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Exactly. absolutely. So exactly. Thank you so much for sharing your, uh, the sites you're seeing. And um, we, we very much appreciate it. So uh, thank, thank you, you for joining much. us. Another round of applause thank for you. you. Okay, well, and now I think we have a brief, um, a brief little segment we've added here just to celebrate a former employee of Griffith Observatory and a former uh, staff member at All Space Considered. Mm -hmm. And Bill volunteered to put together a, a few words that express how all of us feel that, that work on All Space Considered. So um, Bill, take it away. Um, all right, thank you. So um, fans of this show have often seen the work of Sarah Al-Ahmed, one of our behind the scenes producers and also an occasional story presenter. Um, she's now with the Planetary Society where they recently announced that the great Matt Kaplan who has hosted their terrific weekly show, Planetary Radio for 20 years has decided to retire from it. So as you can also read right here on this slide, they have also announced that our dear friend Sarah will be the new host of Planetary Radio. So we want to say a truly heartfelt congratulations from the entire All Space Considered team. We will certainly be listening, Sarah. Way to go. Right on. Yay. Thank you, Bill, for, for that. Um, indeed, congratulations, Sarah. Um, we're all thrilled and excited to be able to listen in on this journey you're going on. And um, it's going to be so much fun. So you know, congratulations again. And now I think, um, Katie, you had some uh, pretty pictures to show off to us tonight. Um, mm -hmm. So take it away. All right. This first, um, these first two images are actually from telescope demonstrator Anthony Perkick, who recently went out to Joshua Tree to capture these. This is the um, Tau uh, Canis Majoris cluster. One of my favorites. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I look at this one all the time. It's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. A bunch <laughs> around one really bright one. It's like a jewel. <laughs> and then this one I also love. This is the Crab Nebula from Anthony. Constellation Taurus. 
And then another one of our telescope demonstrators, Todd Kunioka, took this image. This is actually from July in Joshua Tree National Park, the Milky Way, with the Joshua Tree right in front. And more recently, on October 29th, he was actually in Zion National Park, and that little fuzzy dot right in the middle is the Andromeda Galaxy, and he took that with um, his phone. So I had to include that one. That's a beautiful image. And then some weather, he saw this thunderstorm. This is actually a um, GIF that Google made for him out of some pictures that he took. This is from July 17th. Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And here we have the beautiful um, first quarter moon. This one is from Alexander Kravinyshev who um, sends us pictures from New Jersey. Thank you so much for that, Alexander. And then you might have seen if you're in the area on October 27th, there was a SpaceX launch from Vandenberg. This um, image is actually from Phoenix. My friend Erica was out there and she caught this from the launch and it's so beautiful because you can see the little crescent moon right beneath it. And to some space weather, these are um, some solar flares on the same day, but different images. This is October 10th when Sunspot um, AR3112 exploded and produced these M-class flares. And these actually caused some radio blackouts in South America and the South Pacific. And you can see this map here and um, said that frequencies were um, out for about an hour after each flare hmm. or low. And then this image is really cool. That's Venus on, um, on the top right of the sun, that bright dot and the coronal mass ejection on the bottom. We'll zoom in a little bit because there is actually a comet that um, went right into the sun on this day. This was October 15th. And this is a Croet sun grazer, um, which are um, fragments from the breakup of a single giant comet centuries ago. And then we can see Venus in this image again. This one's actually from the 20th, so five days later. And you can see all of these streamers coming out, which are magnetic loops emerging from the surface of the sun. And during solar minimum, we see streamers um, come from the equator making a Saturn-like image of the sun and uh, solar maximum, they come from all areas. So this is a sign that we are headed towards solar maximum. And this is a similar image here um, from two days later, uh, you can see Venus still up there. And this was actually another um, comet that was that flew right into the sun. If you can see it on the bottom right there in the same area as the last one. And what's cool about this one, we'll zoom in. It was actually a double comet, the smaller one right in front of the larger one. Hmm. So this happens daily, um, almost daily, but sometimes they are uh, just large enough for us to capture them. And then this image of the sun smiling at us is from October 26th. You may have seen it. Um, it's viewing uh, solar wind toward Earth, actually, um, from this 26th image here. And auroras were predicted to appear on October 28th or 29th, potentially. And I don't have any from those specific days, but this one was taken by Maria in Denmark on Halloween, October 31st, and she actually caught a meteor um right in that frame that was spectacular and finally we have a gorgeous image from oliver schwinn who takes incredible aurora images and the milky way as well in this image and that's it for pretty pictures in solar system weather well wonderful stuff there uh katie as always thank you so much for uh, gathering that all for us and putting it together um Beautiful stuff, as always. Yeah. So Patrick, is there anything out there this month that we're going to be able to take a look at that can compete with the stuff that Katie was just showing us? Okay, well, just watch this space. So uh, let's launch into Sky Report uh, for, for this month. Um, and uh, beginning this uh, Sunday, uh, our clocks have to go back one hour, so uh, daylight saving time ends. And this means that the sun sets an hour early, so it gets dark early, which enables you to go out and uh, see the nighttime wonders 
uh, beginning with uh, uh, this view here of uh, the sky as you look towards the south in the evening. Uh, the planet Saturn is in the constellation of Capricornus. It's very hard to see from the city of Los Angeles, the stars of Capricornus. Um, however, um, this picture is taken of the star field where Saturn is, and you can see the stars of Capricornus. It was taken by Anthony Perkett and Katie Features, some of his pictures. Uh, at, when he was out in uh, Joshua Tree. And uh, if we draw the lines between the stars, you can see where Saturn is, and then you can see the outline of Capricornus when we join the lines between its brightest stars, although its brightest stars are not that bright, uh, they're roughly about uh, third magnitude and even close to second magnitude at best. Uh, right next to Capricornus is Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish, and uh, that's up at this time of year in the cold autumn evening. Um, its brightest star is a first magnitude star known as Formahol, uh, which you can see it's uh, the, the brightest star uh, in the south, southern sky um, at this time of year. Moving on to our next uh, planet, uh, this is the bright planet Jupiter. And uh, you've been probably been noticing uh, throughout a, a few months from now, uh, this planet is uh, very bright. And tonight, if you take a peek out of your window, uh, the uh, waxing gibbous moon will be just about four degrees from, uh, from the planet Jupiter. So that's a real nice sight. And once again, uh, here's a picture taken from a dark sky area by Anthony Perkick. And you can see the bright dot there is Jupiter. And where is it in relationship to the, to the constellations? Uh, we draw the lines again and uh, Jupiter is just, um, well, when it's highest in the sky, it's below the constellation of Pisces. And you notice that circle of stars there. That's no, known as the uh, circlet, circlet of, Pis of Pisces. Uh, is, uh, it's one of the heads of Pisces uh, fishes. And then just uh, to the right of that is uh, Pegasus, the flying horse. Another planet that you might notice, which is very, very bright, uh, is uh, rising in the east, northeast, uh, uh, really late, uh, around about 10 p.m. in the middle of the month. If you, and if, even if you go now, you, you should be able to see it uh, in the east, northeast. It's the planet Mars, and it's uh, getting bright, and, and it's unmistakably uh, fiery red uh, when you look at it. And it is buried in amidst the winter, winter constellations. And we'll take a look here. And you might recognize some of the constellations around Mars. We'll draw the lines. There we go. And so Mars is located between, uh, is in Taurus. It's located between Auriga and Orion. And Mars is closest to the right horn of the of Taurus, the bull. Uh, moving on to the early morning sky, something that you might want to take a look at is uh, the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper, the asterism of the Big Dipper, which makes Ursa Major the Great Bear. It's uh, standing on its handle uh, around about 2 a.m. in the middle of the month. And uh, we'll take a look at this picture here. Here's a picture taken by Anthony Perkick. And if you use the two stars at the bowl of the top of the bowl of the Big Dipper, uh, those two stars, the one on the left is called uh, um, uh, Merak and the other one is Dupi. If you uh, draw a line between them, that purple line, you point to the North Star. So the Big Dipper is a useful uh, tool for finding uh, your uh, directions in the sky and particularly finding your direction of North. We have a meteor shower this month. The Lenit meteor shower uh, peaks on the 17th to the morning of the 18th. Peak, peak time is early morning between four and five. And uh, this shower produces roughly about 18 meteors per hour. So it's, um, it's worth going out. You might see uh, one or two meteors uh, just by chance. Now, there is a big, big event. And this big event is this orange looking moon. There is a total lunar eclipse um, on November 8th. In fact, next Tuesday, uh, this eclipse uh, from this map here is visible from Asia, Australia, Pacific and the Americas. And of course, uh, here in our locale of Los Angeles, uh, we will be able to see it. The total lunar eclipse uh, happens when the moon moves into the darkest part of the Earth's shadow known as the umbra. And the moon darkens for just about, uh, just over an hour. 
we have a chart here showing uh, what it would look like as the moon progresses into the uh, shadow of uh, the Earth's shadow. So starting at uh, one minute after midnight, uh, the moon begins to move into the penumbra, the lightest part of the Earth's shadow. And you notice a slight darkening, but not too much. The moon almost looks like it's just a bright full moon. Uh, by 1.09 um, uh, a.m. on uh, Tuesday morning, the east side of the moon begins to move into the dark part of the Earth's shadow, and you will see a significant darkening on the moon's uh, eastern edge or left edge. Totality begins at 2.16 when the moon is completely uh, immersed within the umbra, and it starts to turn uh, reddish in color. You will notice that. Mid-eclipse is at uh, 2.59, so this is the, the greatest eclipse uh, or, or rather the uh, maximum, uh, the time of the maximum eclipse. And uh, when you look at the moon, it's 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 really reddish, um, it has a reddish orange uh, tinge to it. And and all that light that's uh, reflected off the moon comes from the sun, but the sunlight filtered through the Earth's atmosphere, it's refracted. And most of that is in the red part of the spectrum. If you can imagine, you can fly to the moon and look back towards the Earth, You'll see the Earth uh, obscuring uh, the sun. It looks like a ring, and, and there's a ring around it. That ring is the Earth's atmosphere, and that sunlight that's reddish uh, is, is light filtered around the Earth's atmosphere onto the moon. So from the moon, you see a, uh, a total eclipse of the sun, but by the Earth. So as we progress through the night at 3.45 AM, uh, the moon begins to move uh, out of the umbra, and that uh, signals the end of the eclipse. At 4.49, the moon is out of the umbra and into the penumbra and brightens significantly. And at 5.58, the eclipse is over. The duration of this eclipse is three hours, 40 minutes in total. Uh, the, moon's, the moon is total, uh, totally eclipsed for one hour and 25 minutes. Now, if you miss this one, the next total lunar eclipse uh, from Los Angeles or anywhere on Earth is uh, March 13, 14 in 2025. So you don't want to miss this one um, wherever you are um, in the world uh, as you're watching this uh, broadcast because it, it, uh, it is an opportunity to see um, the last eclipse, uh, total eclipse for a while. You can, um, weather permitting, uh, the observatory will broadcast the eclipse live from our telescopes on the roof. So uh, please join us on Eclipse Night for our online broadcast, and there's the link to our website. Just looking at the moon phases for this month, um, full moon is on the 8th, last quarter is on the 16th, new moon is on the 23rd, and uh, first quarter is on the 30th. And so that's your sky report, and don't forget to catch that total lunar eclipse on the 8th. It was a good thing I was muted earlier when my dog was barking, but not so good there. Um, thank you, Patrick, for uh, the sky report and the information there. I'm a little less confident that we're going to have clear skies. I keep hearing reports of water and clouds. And so, folks, yes, we're planning on streaming it, um, but we need to have clear skies to do that. So um, our fingers are crossed. We're ready. I know our team is ready. Our plan is good. It's just a question of if the skies will cooperate with us or not. Um, it it now, will be clear somewhere in the country, so someone will be able to see it. Hopefully somewhere, but I'm hoping we can show it through our telescopes at Griffith yes. Observatory. It's always a, a pleasure for folks to gather, and we have an international community that gathers with us. Um, sometimes there's millions of people logged in, all just kind of enjoying watching this eclipse. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, now, last month, we did take a quick look at... Uh, that DART mission where we were trying to learn whether we can move an asteroid from its orbit, especially if one that was on its way to hit us. And um, there's lots of asteroids out there called near Earth asteroids that um, potentially could hurt Earth if they were to run into it. But um, who knew that the Arecibo telescope has something to do with those near Earth asteroids? Um, Arecibo tragically is no longer with us as a telescope and is being canceled, but I'm sure Sarah's got some words about that as well. Um, but 
it's just an interesting result coming out of data that came from Arecibo that is no longer with us. Sarah wanted to have some words on it. And I said, yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yes, take it away. Tell us about some of these asteroids that are out there that might run into us and what did Arecibo have to do with it? <laughs> oh, hey, all right. Just that Thanks. little question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, before I do get started on the asteroids themselves, like you said, I want to talk a little bit about the dish itself, because I, I get partial to equipment, I get attached, and Arecibo was uh, it featured heavily in several movies from my childhood, so I'm attached to Arecibo. It was pretty sad when it, we lost it. Um, one of the things that really struck me about the collapse was that there was such great footage of it. It was almost as if they were filming it. It's almost as if it was uh, anticipated. I, as I was doing research for this, um, for this story, I did come across why that happened. They were filming something at Arecibo the day of the collapse, and I've got just the quick video of it. Um, and it's, so this is B-roll. They were just filming the observatory, getting the, getting the background stuff that they could throw in anywhere. There's the central piece. And, oh my gosh, and who doesn't love a radio telescope? Anyway, <laughs> but then I saw this. There was a guy walking on the struts that collapsed, the walkways that collapsed. Fear not, he made it all the way down before this. Later in the day, but amazing that it was captured I I, I just I, I'm glad that they had the cameras in place to capture that with the audio. It's 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 chilling when you hear it full volume because that was loud. Um, but after the uh, telescope collapsed, the um, the astronomy world knows how important Arecibo was, and there was a call to rebuild. The National Science Foundation ran uh, Arecibo. It ran, still runs the complex, and astronomers were calling for them to rebuild it. Um, unfortunately, uh, as Dr. Reitzel said, it is not happening. On October 13th, the uh, NSF released their plans for the Arecibo site. Uh, they released a solicitation for bids from contractors to change the facility. Uh, what they, they plan to do with the Arecibo uh, Observatory site is create a new multidisciplinary world-class educational center. It will be called ACER or Arecibo Center for STEM Education and Research. The goals are to promote STEM education, to promote STEM participation. Amazing. Love it. Unfortunately, that solicitation says very clearly that they want the bidders to reimagine the complex. They are not looking to run another telescope, a 305 meter telescope filling an entire valley for the next 40 years. So Arecibo is unfortunately no more. Uh, oh, I forgot to advance to this. This is just crushing. The it, it splattered on the side of the valley, and it hurts to see. Um, but this comes at either a real time or a really great time for Arecibo because it's a really proud moment for Arecibo. The data that Arecibo collected uh, is how we chose the system for the DART mission to impact. This image here is the, is the data from Arecibo. It sent radio, <laughs> radio signals out, it captured them back, captured the reflections, and uh, you can see that there's the larger object and the smaller object, that's, the, uh, that's Didymos and Dimorphos, the tiny little moon. And th this data was absolutely crucial for not just picking the DART mission, but for realizing that we needed the DART mission. Arecibo is responsible for finding oh so many of these asteroids. This is from NASA Eyes 
uh, asteroid visualizer. I've highlighted the Didmos system, but all of those little blue specks are near Earth asteroids. We are not done mapping them out. Uh, just within lurking within those little blue dots are at least 70 potential threats to Earth that were found by Arecibo. Yeah, it was an important fish. Uh, and not just uh, the, the announcement of it not being rebuilt coming on the heels of DART, that's not the last bit. The largest data set of studies of, <laughs> of collection of asteroid information was just released. It's a mere two years of Arecibo data collected into one place. It's approximately 191 asteroids where using Arecibo's incredible powers, uh, <laughs> its instrumentation, um, these asteroids were modeled, uh, the, their shapes, their uh, sizes, their reflectivity in radio, in radio. And that's incredibly important for moving forward in mining. As we look to mine asteroids, we're going to be looking for metal-rich asteroids. And Arecibo, in just the last two years of its data, found two. Uh, they're incredibly rare. Two out of 191 is a gold mine or an iron mine. However, whatever is going to be found over there. <laughs> but Arecibo's mission is not complete. It's, oh, the slide is not advancing. There we go. It has a lasting mes message. Uh, this, this is called the Arecibo message. It was designed by Frank Drake. Yes, that Drake of the Drake equation was transmitted in 1974. And it is carrying Arecibo's legacy out to the stars. I wanted this to feel a little bit like an in memoriam. So first light, November 1st, 1963. Collapse, December 1st, 2020. Arecibo. It went out with a bang. And you gotta love that. <laughs> yeah, it was it was hard to believe those pictures were real and that video was real. And the sound of those snapping cables, it was so heart-wrenching and mm -hmm hearing the metal being bent and collapsing on top of itself. You just had to worry. I hope there was no maintenance workers, nobody down there on it as this is happening. And yeah, it's uh, Arecibo figured prominently in, you know, probably me becoming an astronomer, primarily due to stuff like, you know, contact and, you know, uh, just, just the idea of this giant dish that maybe could pick up a radio signal from another intelligent civilization that's using radio to communicate. Well, this was this was our big ear. This was our, our the one we listened with, and uh, it didn't happen. We never picked up that intelligent communication from another star yet. I still think it could be out there, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's pretty crazy. So Arecibo did we definitely did discover a lot of asteroids with it. We found a lot, but last week in the chat, we were having some fun talking about, well, how do rocks form in space? Like, do you just start with a little speck and then soon you have a pebble floating around and then soon you have a whole bunch of pebbles that get together and, you know, eventually just have a big agglomeration. Uh, this comes back to the DART mission again. And uh, Haley Bricker said, I can answer that for you. Um, again, another one of our very talented producers and Haley put together the following segment. Sarah, is there any other intro we needed to do before we run? I, I was just going to say uh, Arecibo was great at finding cold rocks in cold space. And speaking of cold rocks in cold space, Haley's got you covered. <laughs> I, okay, I don't, I'm not going to endorse that one way or another, but um, I'll let you, you have that intro. Anyway, let's take a look and find out and learn a little bit about forming uh, rocky asteroids in space and uh, how do you make the rocks out there? Sarah did such a great job of introducing us to Arecibo, particularly the most recent work released, including how Arecibo even helped with the DART mission. So Arecibo has actually been one of the most productive telescopes in our observing arsenal, particularly for rocky bodies out in the solar system. 
It's been responsible for collecting data of over 850 near-Earth asteroids. And it's also allowed us to further resolve other aspects of these bodies like sizes, the shapes, the spins, and even their surfaces. And in fact, Arecibo has also helped scientists confirm that there are moons around these near-Earth asteroids. So we would call those binary and triple asteroid systems in which two or three asteroids are actually all orbiting one another. So Arecibo has done the lion's share of work in progressing the field of asteroid detection and identification. But if you're as much of a space nerd as I am, you might be asking how these rocks that Arecibo detects even form in space to begin with. So I'll take you all the way back to the beginning of our own solar system, some four and a half billion years ago. In short, rocks are actually made from stardust. When a star dies, forming either a supernova or a planetary nebula, it ejects plasma and gas of different elements into the universe. So from the death of these stars come the ingredients for the next generation to form. So these protostars form in stellar nursery regions when the gas and dust clouds start to collapse. And as this happens, in order to preserve the angular momentum of that collapse or the energy of the system, the clouds shrink, they spin faster, and they flatten out into what we call a protoplanetary disk. And then, over the course of the next few million years, these bits of stardust clumps start to slowly cool and stick together. So there's so much material in this protoplanetary disk that collisions are incredibly hard to avoid. And as more and more of these particles collide together, they form larger and larger clumps in the disk. And at this point, these stardust clumps are now called planetesimals. So much like their smaller bits and pieces, these planetesimals float through space, interact with one another, and eventually collide to form larger bodies called protoplanets. So we are well on the way to forming planetary bodies like we see today in our own solar system underneath this model. And thanks to new observations and exosolar systems, we also see uh, what we think are very similar processes happening elsewhere in the galaxy. And so in our solar system, as the planets continued to build up in size, the leftover material was shepherded into different regions of the solar system, such as the asteroid belt, and in the case of comets, the Kuiper belt. So we detect this material today in the form of asteroids and comets, respectively. So a lot of this planet forming hypothesis might sound like conjecture, but it's actually very well supported through the study of meteorites. So meteorites land on Earth from space and are rock fragments from some of these leftover asteroid bodies that are still floating around in space. So when a meteorite lands on Earth, it provides researchers with a fantastic opportunity to study this material that escaped planet formation. And so some of these meteorites have collections of minerals in them called chondrules. And these are thought to reflect the earliest composition of the solar system, particularly the sun, and may have formed by a flash heating of stardust grains to approximately 1,000 degrees Kelvin or about 730 degrees Celsius. If a meteorite has these glassy chondrules, we call them a chondrite. And so chondrules are typically found in non-metallic stony meteorites, and they make up uh, about 80% of all meteorites that fall to the Earth's surface. So we have a ton of opportunities to learn about them. And so these chondrules were molten and cooled before being incorporated into their parent bodies. So they're even older than the asteroids and meteorites that we actually find them in. And so it's through the study of these chondrules and other very old rocky inclusions that we've deduced the age of the solar system to be at least four and a half billion years old. So you can thank rocks for the age of our solar system. So how does this tell us anything about planet formation in a much broader sense? What about other star systems? Well, studying meteorites allows us to make observations about the mechanisms and the chemical processes of rock formation, which intrinsically allows us to build a history from the ground up of how planets formed. And so throughout the galaxy, we're observing planets around other stars called exoplanets that are in the process of forming today. So coupled with our geochemical measurements of meteorites, these observations allow us to test important ideas and hypotheses about how planet formation works. Much of this knowledge provides the basis for what researchers, like our guest, Dr. Curry, study. So if we can figure out how our solar system started, how rocks first started forming and differentiated into the planets we see today, then we can apply some of this knowledge to exoplanet formation in far off star systems. 
So thank you so much for coming along on this blast through the past of the solar system to learn about rocks and why they're so important um, to so many different parts of planetary science and even astrophysics today. Wow, well, that was fantastic, Haley. Um, I super appreciate it. I've gone into Jared territory, which is not good. Let me back it up and stop things. Um, anyway, I appreciate that uh, explanation of forming exoplanets, forming the uh, rocks and bits that go into them, and how all of that happens in a solar nebula. So um, thank you, Haley, for, for tying that all together with us. That's um, super, super amazing, and I appreciate it. We're going to have to edit that one down and make it a standalone feature on our YouTube channel as well, because uh, folks deserve to know um, all about what, what Haley just threw down. That was some, some great stuff. Um, now, Jared, are you there? Are you here? Are you ready? I certainly am ready to go. Okay. All right. Well, take it away. Um, and uh, I, I hope something interesting happened this month or, or, or it's all over. Well, we did have a few interesting things in the rocketry world happen this month. Uh, I guess we have to open with who we're going to talk about from here to the, uh, the end of time when it comes to rocketry, which is SpaceX. They are chasing the mythical 52 launches in a year. So as you can see, since our last show that we had in October, when we talked about them, they've had eight launches in that time period. And they just had their 51st launch of the year yesterday. Uh, and this is some really great footage from the launch of Hotbird 13F there in the middle of the month <laughs> with the stage landing as you had that plume coming up behind it. But yeah, it is. Uh, it has been an amazing amazing cadence as we've been talking about all year from SpaceX. They said that they were going to do 52 launches in a year, one about every week, and they are now probably going to be doing that in just a matter of days. Uh, this is a new record for a single type of rocket. So as you flew 47 times in 1979, that was the previous record. But of course, like I said, Falcon 9, it now holds the new record. It's at 51 with a plus there because we have still got quite a few launches to go. In addition to that, SpaceX brought Crew-4 home from the International Space Station aboard Crew Dragon. Taking a look here at this great shot of the Drogue parachutes deploying, which was the first time I can recall ever seeing that live, and then dropping the Drogues and deploying the four main chutes as they reef out and open up. So they open up nice and easy, so that way there's no tears on the parachutes there. Of course, Crew Dragon splashes down in the Atlantic Ocean just off of the coast of Florida and take a nice little look <laughs> at those four good main chutes. It's what we like to see. And finally, uh, cruising on down into the Atlantic for a nice little swim for our capsule that is freshly home from space. And with the four astronauts home, everybody seemed to be pretty happy on board of SpaceX's recovery ship. And once they got the Dragon on board, they pulled all the astronauts out. And as you can see, say they look pretty thrilled right there, giving a nice clap and a probably a let's go and let's do it. So hopping over to China, they just launched a module for their Tiangong space station called Mentiang. And this module is going to continue to add on to the size uh, of their growing space station. You get to see if they are going to add on any additional modules besides this. They're supposed to probably add on another set of solar panels, uh, possibly. But this launched the uh, on a Long March 5, which is China's largest rocket, and its second stage stayed in orbit. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But ultimately, it was all about getting Mengtian on to Tiangong. And we could see here this nice live view from their rocket and Mission Control. Everybody pretty happy to see that module well on its way. And then just a few days later, arriving at Tiangong. And we'll get a really, really nice view from the cameras on the module. And then looking back from the cameras on the space station, I got to say their camera, their cameras that they've used, they've been doing some uh, some pretty good coverage uh, of that for uh, for their usual secrecy that they do with most of their launches. Uh, so, so taking a 
Taking a nice look from there. And then we could see it was in orbital nighttime when the module arrived. And this is a bit sped up here. We don't have our modules attached to our space stations that fast, but boom, there we go. And the upper stage of that long March 5 burned to depletion. It means there was no more fuel on board, which means that it stayed in space. Uh, and that's a little bit of a problem because the upper stage of China's largest rocket is absolutely massive, which means that it's big enough and it's heavy enough that parts of it could actually make it to the surface. So this makes it a little bit of a problem when its orbit causes it to overfly most of the inhabited areas in the world. So we always tend to uh, look a bit carefully when <laughs> those upper stages are up there and when they're coming back. And eventually uh, it did come back this morning. Uh, so the US Space Command confirmed the People's Republic of China, the upper stage from that long March rocket, re-entered the atmosphere over the South Central Pacific Ocean at 4.01 a.m. Mountain Time uh, today. Uh, I love this a little bit at the end. They said, for details on the uncontrolled re-entry's impact location, we once again refer you to the People's Republic of China. So in other words, stop asking us, go ask China where it landed at. Uh, and it's thought to be somewhere just off of the coast of Mexico out in that area of the Pacific. So China dropping rocket stages, hoping they'll get a little bit better at the stewardship of that in, uh, in later times in, uh, in their work. Now, the Indian Space Research Organization is helping out the communications company OneWeb build out their own satellite internet constellation as well. So it's not just SpaceX with Starlink, which they're doing now, or Amazon with Project Kuiper, which is going to be coming up pretty soon. Uh, OneWeb is also using, uh, already launching and already has uh, several hundred of their own satellites in, uh, in orbit around the Earth and providing communications to folks who may have the receivers and the, the transmitters for them in order to do that. Uh, so it was a successful launch deploying all of those satellites successfully. And I love this little one going from the animation that ISRO provided to a actual camera on board of the upper stage watching those satellites very slowly deploy from that upper stage. So really cool that they were able to see that in real time there. Now, this is Russia's proton rocket. Russia actually had quite a lot of launches uh, this month, but I figured this would probably be the one to uh, cover because Russia's proton rocket, its days are numbered. It is a relic of the Cold War, first flying in the late 60s. Uh, it is a heavy lift rocket, probably uh, one of Russia's biggest, but Russia is replacing it with the Angara series of rockets, which two of those actually flew this month. So they're getting ready uh, to work on that. Only a handful of protons left, and this was a launch of Angolasat. Uh, for communication satellite uh, going up into geosynchronous orbit. So uh, congrats to them on doing that and all of their launches that they had successfully performed this past month. And then we're going to go from one big rocket to another big rocket. Let's take a look at what happened because it looks like this is at Vandenberg, but actually no, it's at the Kennedy Space Center. So let's take a look. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, And yes, uh, your eyes are not deceiving you. That is a side booster attached to that Falcon 9 because Falcon Heavy has returned after a three-year hiatus, mostly owing to the problems with the payload it was going to be carrying, which was the U.S. Space Force Mission 44, USSF-44, uh, carrying up directly into geosynchronous orbit. This is a long mission for a Falcon 9, the longest for its upper stage, six hours after launch is when it finally put those satellites into their orbit. But of course, one of the things with a Falcon Heavy is that we do get a spectacular- We can see the grid fins there. Both on side boosters transonic. Stage two FTS is saved. Stage two is in terminal guidance. We can see those grid fins steering the boosters for a precise landing. Again, we're attempting Booster landing. Landing, landing zone one and two. Thank you. 
thrusters at landing zone one and landing zone two. What an incredible sight. Man, I never, never, ever get tired of seeing those, those <laughs> boosters land, let alone two of them at the same time in the same relative place. This is absolutely amazing for them to do it. And I also appreciate this time they were staggering them. Of course, that wasn't something that they built in. It's just the way the physics of the rockets returning work. So absolutely fantastic. Congrats uh, to SpaceX on the return of Falcon Heavy. We may have one more Falcon Heavy flight before the end of the year. But also to note about this Falcon Heavy flight, only the side boosters returned. The U.S. Air Space Force actually did pay extra to expend the center core. That means it burnt all of its fuel and ended up uh, expending as much of its energy as possible. This was a very high energy mission. The payload required it burning all of its fuel. So the Space Force kind of threw out some more dollars in order to make that happen. Because if you, you know, want to throw away a reusable rocket, SpaceX isn't really big on that. And also, you got to tell us about Artemis because our space launch system rocket finally just rolled out today to had 39 very excited there's gonna be a few more tests you're gonna be done out there basically getting it ready to go but that launch window is going to open on november 13th 2107 pacific time or 907 in the evening for us here on the west coast uh so of course don't forget about uh about the time change coming up it does affect uh some of these websites where you can get the dates and times for launches coming up and speaking of launches coming up, of course, we have Vandenberg Space Force based here in Southern California. And if you feel so inclined to go take a gander at what they're going to be throwing into space, you sure can. And in fact, the next launch is just a little under a week away. It'll be on November 10th, Thursday morning at 0125. So 125 in the morning, you early risers are going to be able to get there to see the final Atlas V uh, launch from Vandenberg. Of course, the Atlas rockets have a very long lineage at Vandenberg going all the way back to the, inter the original Atlas intercontinental ballistic missiles in the late 50s at Vandenberg. This is JPSS-2. It's the payload. It is a weather satellite for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So I'm going to be helping us with that. At some point during November, we should see another Starlink launch from uh, from SpaceX. I don't know what time it's going to be at. So you couldn't find anything with that yet. Uh, another mission on a Falcon 9 will be launching on December 5th. The current current time that I could find for it is at 12.45 in the morning or 0045 on December 5th. So another, another early riser, it's called SWAT, which is actually going to measure the height of the ocean and waves on the ocean as well. This one will be potentially a return to launch site landing. So that means the booster would come back to Vandenberg and you can actually see it uh, come on back and hear the sonic booms and hear the Merlin engine kick in as it lands. Uh, so that's not entirely confirmed because that was just on the license uh, that was given to them. So we'll have to see what SpaceX uh, officially says. And then there will be another launch at some point in December called Tranche Zero. This is going to be a test, uh, some test satellites from the United States Space Force testing sort of their own communication constellation. So I guess it's the new hotness nowadays. Everybody's got to have their own constellation of communication satellites out there. So they're going to launch several of them. And that is a confirmed return to launch site landing on that one. Those satellites are apparently lightweight enough that, that it's been known for months now that that booster will be coming back to, learn, uh, to land at Vandenberg Space Force Base. And that is your out to launch covering October 4 and November of 2022. Thank you, as always. Um, fascinating stuff. I love those uh, Falcon Heavy launches. I just do the two boosters coming back. I, it's, it's some of my favorite stuff in terms of rocketry. Well, um, thank you, Jared. We'll, uh, we'll catch you again next month for the, the next set of launches. Um, well, right now, let's move on to a story that Chris has that's that's full of mystery and and uh intrigue and um anyway uh take it away chris what do you what do you have for us tonight that's taken us all the way back to 100 a.d it looks like which okay i'm ready i'm ready even farther back than this my internet's a little twitchy this evening let's see how i do um claudius ptolemy 
famously produced a star catalog. It's one of the very oldest first ones that we have, an official list of all 48 constellations that were known at that time. Um, however, Claudius Ptolemy referenced the fact that he had been looking at a very good star catalog made before him, 200 years before him, by another legendary astronomer and mathematician of the ancient Greek world. And this was made not by him, but by Hipparchus of Nicaea. Hipparchus is actually one of the astronomers honored on our monument out in front of the building. A legendary figure, uh, for example, the father of trigonometry. Uh, he's one of the people, the very first, in fact, ever to make a mathematical model for the motions of the sun and the moon. And he's regarded widely as the most careful uh, observer of the astronomy world uh, of the ancient times. He took very careful and precise measurements. Everyone would love to have a look at his atlas. Now, Ptolemy's atlas was, the originals are long gone, but these were copied and copied and copied, and versions of Ptolemy's catalog made it down to our time, but not that of Hipparchus. It's a lost relic of the ancient world. Astronomers have been looking for hundreds of years to see if they could find it, and they think they may have done it, and not like they if you look behind the couch and found, oh, here it is, right? Here's Hipparchus's star catalog. They found it in a different place. Um, this is a, I have to check my Latin here. This is the Codex Climaci Rescriptus, which is a religious document uh, from the fourth century AD, long after Hipparchus's time, that was found in the monastery of St. Catherine in uh, the Sinai area of Egypt. It's a very, very old monastery. And because these documents have religious importance, they're being studied, studied by historians. But in ancient times, the parchment was hard to make. Often, because it was such a laborious process, if you got a parchment, you would scrape off old ink that had been written on it, and you could start again. So you would reuse it and reuse it. And when they looked very carefully at some of these documents in the Climaxi Rescriptus, they found behind the text, behind this religious text that were describing the Gospels and so on, uh, which are interesting in their own right, but when they process it, looking at different wavelengths of light, if you look carefully here, you'll see kind of reddish tints. It turns out those are not only old remnants of ink that had been put on this document, but they're Greek and they're older. Now, when they went through and did their uh, processing on this, here's a little animation showing the process. They were were able to trace out in ancient Greek what was said on the document long ago, this piece of parchment that had been reused. And lo and behold, those are star names, those are coordinates, very precise coordinates. And it turns out it's almost certainly the long lost star catalog of uh, Hipparchus. Now, this is an amazing thing, not only because it's, well, it's interesting in a historical document, maybe the very first detailed star catalog with precise measurements, and of course made by a famous man, but you remember we said Ptolemy had done this about 200 years later? Well, yes, but now we can compare Ptolemy's work to the original of Hipparchus, and it turns out Ptolemy is about twice as inaccurate. Hipparchus was able to get his measurements down to about one degree of accuracy. He probably had to invent most of the instruments he used to make this star catalog. So we don't have all of it. There's just fragments that have been copied, and yes, this is a copy. It's not Hipparchus's original. This is hundreds of years of copies, but we've got fragments of it, and they haven't looked at all of the parchment at St. Catherine's Monastery. They're looking at more of them, and we may get more and more information on one of the most important documents ever made in classical astronomy. So that's our discovery. Pretty neat stuff. That is really incredible stuff. Um, 
it, it makes you wonder what else was lost when they scraped off these, you know, documents in the past. What what other things could be in there? And uh, they're just scraping off the Parkus's star catalog, I guess. Um, yeah. Anyway, it, it's the way history goes, but I'm glad it's being discovered now. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly interesting. Well, I have one final story to close this out on tonight. Um, it, it's about something called a gamma ray burst. And I'm gonna show you a little picture here of it happening in the sky. Not terribly exciting necessarily. It's a spot of light that gets brighter in X-rays and gamma rays and then fades away. A typical gamma ray burst lasts a fraction of a second, less than a second. Um, those are called the short ones, the long gamma ray bursts, maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds, uh, maybe a minute is typical. Well, there was, there was one that just happened early October that lasted 10 hours, and it was the brightest gamma ray burst we've ever found. So something was going on with that, something a little different, and I'm going to tell you about it. Well, first of all, what is a gamma ray burst? Well, gamma rays are just a form of light, another form of electromagnetic radiation. So visible light is another form of electromagnetic radiation, but our eyes are sensitive to it. We can see it. If you go a little bit shorter, you get ultraviolet. That's the stuff that can give you sunburns, um, but we don't see it with our, uh, with our eyes. X-ray is the same thing. We don't have X-ray eyes, but certainly your dentist can use it with the special detectors. Our bones block it, uh, soft tissues do not. And then gamma rays are even more energetic. They're even shorter wavelength. They're so energetic, they can blow their way through um, skin and bone. Um, they can be quite dangerous and create a lot of mutations if there's a lot of gamma rays around. So gamma rays are things that we kind of worry about. We don't want to necessarily have a gamma ray burst go off right next door. Um, so we wanted to learn about these. When, when it was discovered there are gamma ray bursts that happen out there in space, we have space telescopes that search for them and warn us about them. When they see the characteristic of one happening, they'll notify one another where to go look so they can point the telescopes in the right direction and capture what happened. Well, turns out that we learned and uh, we believe that most gamma ray bursts have to do with um, the formation of a black hole. So whether it is a colliding neutron stars that'll collide together and create a short gamma ray burst, or whether it's a supernova, a supermassive star, something 20, 30 times the mass of the sun, near the end of its life, um, an object that turns into what's called a collapsar. And um, it turns out a, a colleague of mine in grad, graduate school, a friend of mine that I was in school with, was the one working on this model with Stan Woosley. So Andrew McFadden and Stan Woosley came up with the Collapsar model. And today we think this is probably what most uh, of these longer gamma ray bursts are caused by a, a star that actually collapses and explodes. So let's take a look at a little animation here of what that might look like. And that beam, that jet of material actually goes out both directions but it's brightened in the direction you're facing it. And we think that to see a gamma ray burst, you need to be lined up exactly with that jet of material that comes out. The star itself has blown off its outer layers. The inner layers collapse down and form a black hole, but just outside where that black hole is forming, you form a jet of material that creates nearly speed of light speeds for this material as it shoots out of the star, burrows its way through, destroying the rest of the star, um, literally obliterating the star in this process, and it will be brighter than an entire galaxy for a while. Here's the actual data that was taken and put together into a little animation. The gamma ray burst is the brighter object in the top center there that gets very bright. The swath going sort of diagonally here, let's move the laser pointer across it, that's actually our very own Milky Way galaxy. So that's all the neutron stars and um, gamma ray bright objects glowing within the disk of our own galaxy. And this explosion that happened 2 billion light years away. So this is not within our own galaxy, despite the fact it looks like it might have been there. Um, it outshone our own galaxy in terms of gamma rays by a lot for a brief period of time, even though it is 2 billion light years away. So this is in a galaxy completely somewhere else. In fact, this is a map of the first 500 gamma ray bursts now that we have many thousands of them, but you can see they don't concentrate across the center of the Milky Way. 
Um, you can take a look here. They don't line up with the disk of our galaxy or with the bulge of our galaxy. If they did, we'd see a whole bunch of points there. And well, we don't. They're scattered every in every direction. So this tells us they're extra galactic. They're happening in galaxies beyond our own primarily. Well, what about this one that just happened? It was incredibly bright. Was this one in our own galaxy? The answer is no. Like I said, it was about 2 billion light years away. Um, this, what we're seeing here, is actually dust within our own galaxy reflecting those uh, x-rays back at us. I think this is an x-ray image. And you can see the bright exploding star, the gamma ray burst happening here in the center, sending x-rays, and then a ring of them outside where there's some dust located there. And the light's actually bouncing off that dust and heading back towards Earth. And then a little bit later, this ring lit up. And then a little bit later, the, the very most outer ring lit up. Um, as that light had time to travel to it and bounce off that dust. So we're seeing all this stuff happening live, which is, is, is quite amazing. Now, is this dangerous for Earth? Um, could this gamma ray burst strip our atmosphere? Could it ca cause problems for us to live here? Um, well, yeah, it, something could like this. It, it would be a very bad day if one went off nearby. This one did affect our atmosphere, actually. There was some ionization that happened. Some radio telescopes that are actually designed to listen for lightning strikes noticed a change in their performance and their calibration exactly at the time that this gamma ray burst hit Earth. So they had these, you know, they're listening for lightning strikes, essentially. Well, they got out of tune, is one way to think of it, due to the change in the way the atmosphere was working. Um, now, the good news is there's no... Uh, stars capable of exploding as a gamma ray burst, as one of these uh, hypernova or a collapse are, um, none close enough to Earth that we know of. We've mapped out a lot of the stars near us, in fact, most of them. Um, it would have to be something like a pair of neutron stars somehow being very quiescent and quiet, but close enough and being able to merge that maybe could cause trouble for us. But there are certainly no you know, 20 to 50 solar mass stars close enough to us to send a beam at us and to fry Earth and have a really, really, really bad day. So that's the good news here, is these things are out there, they are dangerous, they're rare, but they are not any close enough to us to, to really cause trouble to us. I know, kitten, so we can end on a positive note. Um, so anyway, gamma ray bursts, incredibly powerful um, explosions um, coming from supernovae, but uh, we don't have to worry too much. There's not one gonna be super close to us and we can keep studying them. Anyway, thank you all for joining us at uh, tonight's All Space Considered. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters, uh, Chris, Katie, Jared, Patrick, um, Haley, Sarah. Um, thank you so much. And of course, Bill as well did a short presentation tonight. Um, appreciate all the help we get from everybody in creating the show. Matthew, I know you were in the booth by yourself tonight. Thank you so much for that. Um, but just thanks to everybody out there that makes All Space Considered possible, our Griffith Observatory Foundation members um, that help us so much. I'd like to thank the City of LA, Department of Recreation and Parks that owns and operates Griffith Observatory. And come see us, we're open again. You can come to the observatory. You do still need proof of vaccination, but you no longer have to wear a mask if you're indoors. Um, so anyway, come on to Griffith Observatory, check out our telescopes. And um, the next broadcast we're going to have will be for the total lunar eclipse, but stay tuned. We're waiting for those weather reports. So anyway, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Thane Curry, as our final thanks tonight uh, for being our very special guest and talking about AB Arage B, um, an exoplanet that they've imaged. So we actually have a picture of this very young, about a 10 solar mass or a 10 Jupiter mass um, exoplanet. So thank you, Dr. Curry, for joining us tonight. Um, goodbye, everybody.